In this presentation, we'll take a look at the books of Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 1, announcing the coming of Christ. We will take a look at four individuals and how Christ and his coming Messiahship is announced to them and how we can liken these things unto ourselves. So, first of all, the Annunciation to Zacharias. This is Luke chapter 1, verses 8 through 20. The Annunciation to Zacharias, the husband of Elizabeth. First of all, the priest's ministry in the temple. Just a little background. There were between twenty to 25,000 priests, literal descendants of Aaron, in Israel at this time. So our best estimates, that gives us how many priests there were. Most of the priests, however, because of apostasy, were unworthy, prideful, disobedient, dishonest, violent, and immoral at this time. You understand that Israel for 400 years has been in a state of apostasy. And so many of the priests were not really worthy to serve in the temple, even though they do. They're living in a time of apostasy. What were the priestly duties of the temple? Well, the offering, the morning and evening incense, trim the lamps of the golden candlestick and filled them with oil, set out the shewbread weekly, kept up the fire of the great altar, removed the ashes of the sacrifices, slain cutting up of the sacrifices with the sprinkling of their blood and laid the offerings of all kinds on the altar of sacrifice. So those were the different duties in the temples that Zacharias would have been involved in. The priests were divided into 24 courses. So they had 24 different groups, uh, enabling each priest to officiate in the temple twice each year. So twice a year, they would go to officiate in the temple because there were so many priests that's how often your turn came around to go officiate well let's look specifically Zachariah's ministry in the temple this is Luke 1 verses 8 through 10 angelic ministrations do not come to carnal and godless souls it is those who seek after righteousness the blessings of heaven who are permitted to see within the veil Zacharias, we learn, therefore, was a righteous and faithful priest. He's one of the few in Israel who had kept up a level of righteousness that was not common in Israel at the time. As it says in Luke 1, 5 through 6, there were in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Aviv, I'm sorry, Avia. And his wife was of the daughters of Aaron. Her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. So we do know there were some who were faithful and received certain light and knowledge that was missing as a whole in all of Israel. Elizabeth and Zacharias being two of those few and far between. Zacharias was of the course of Avia, which course officiated in the temple, the records we have, Jewish records, in April and October. As best as can be determined, Zacharias was coming to the temple in October of the year 6 BC. So this event that we're talking about in Luke is probably this particular October. The most cherished service was that of offering of incense upon the altar of incense in the holy place in the temple, which symbolized the offering of prayers ascending to God. Just as the smoke from the incense ascended up to heaven, so were the prayers of Israel to ascend to the divine throne. Usually this opportunity only came to one once in a lifetime that you would, the lot would fall upon you to actually be the one to offer incense. And while that incense is burning and the smoke is rising, that priest would stand there and offer a prayer, which we're going to see in behalf of all of Israel. 
This was considered probably the most special that each priest looked forward to at least once in their lifetime to be able to go to. It was Zacharias's lot this time in all his years of service to officiate in the burning of incense upon the altar of incense. Let's take a look at Gabriel's appearance, message Zacharias. Let's take a look at Luke 1, 11 through 20. Zacharias would be carrying the incense, another priest carrying the coals from the altar of incense. These he would spread upon the altar of incense and withdraw. Then Zacharias would sprinkle the incense upon the burning coals and pray on behalf of all Israel that the ascending smoke and odor might typify the ascending prayers of Israel. So that is kind of the mechanics of all of this. What did Zacharias pray for? Remember, he was to offer prayer as that incense was burning, as that smoke was then rising. Well, certainly not for his wife, Elizabeth, to bear a child, because this was not a time for private importunings, but for public prayer. He was acting on behalf of all Israel, not for himself and Elizabeth alone. So he, when this angel comes at this particular time, he's not praying they could have a child. First of all, they're way past childbearing ages. And he was officiating on behalf of all of Israel. So what would he have been praying for? As had been for years, Israel's prayer was for redemption, the deliverance from the Gentile yoke, from freedom from sin, for the coming of the Messiah. So that's what he would have been offering in prayer on behalf of Israel, that the day would finally come, the Messiah would come and relieve them of the yoke of sin and the burden of sin and free them from sin. The awaited time had come for the Messiah to appear in the flesh among the people. Zacharias and all of Israel's prayer was going to be answered. So this is what the angel was referring to when he said, Zacharias, thy prayers have been heard. The prayer of the coming Messiah. In fact, this is what it says in Luke 1.13. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. See, from that, we get we make the mistake and think, oh, he was praying for Elizabeth to have a son. That prayer was answered. No, the prayer that the Messiah would come is answered. That's what he would have been praying for. And a part of that to happen, his wife Elizabeth must bear a son for the prophet to prepare the way. So what he was praying for was the coming of the Messiah. And so the angel says, fear not, it is now time. Your prayer that you have prayed on behalf of all Israel, and in answer to that, your wife is going to have a child. So he gets actually, I'm sure that prayer had been in their hearts for a long time. Two of them answered. We know signs are not given to produce faith, but given to those who are already faithful to strengthen them. Read carefully Doctrine and Covenants, section 63, verses 7 through 10. It clearly states in there that God does not give signs to develop faith or to gain faith. No. He says, I don't do that. But I do give signs to those who already have faith. To the faithful, signs are appropriate to strengthen them and to encourage them and to show them that they're on the right track. That's what section 63, 7 through 10 says to those who already have faith. Thus, Zacharias' being stricken, dumb, and deaf was no, not so much as a punishment for unbelief, for signs do not come to the unbelieving. See, that can't be it. Oh, well, I'm going to punish you because you didn't believe my message. Well, if he was unbelieving, he wouldn't have got the appearance of the angel in the first place. 
but it was a sign of God's miraculous power, which would be impressed upon Zacharias and the people. See, he would come out of the temple, and he is stricken. He can't hear, and he can't speak, and so something must have happened, and I'm sure he wrote things down, and they would have now paid more attention. So this was to get their attention to show, look, God's power is here. It is with you. These things are going to happen, and they are going to happen by the power of God. This sign would also try and test Zachariah and Elizabeth to further sanctifying of their souls. Can you imagine for nine months being deaf and dumb? That must have been very trying for him, and to continue on with life as normal. And so the sign was to help strengthen their faith that they already had. Remember, they were righteous people, one of the few priests who were. And so this was a sign to help strengthen their faith. Let's now turn to the Annunciation to Mary. How does Mary find out that the Messiah is coming? This is Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. Mary was about 15 years of age. Brother McConkie in his The Mortal Messiah says, under contract to marry one she loved, but with child by the power of the Holy Ghost. We find her in a city of Galilee, rough, rugged, untempered Galilee, with a self-righteous people who are quick to condemn. Never ready, ever ready to punish, where the tongue of gossip would cut her tender feelings to the bone where she would become a hiss and a byword among her friends and relatives, for she had, as they would view it, committed the sin next only in wickedness to murder. Those among whom she dwelt would no more believe her strange tale than an angel had come to her. Angels no longer came to mortals. Everyone knew that. Or that the Almighty himself was the father of that which was in her womb. They would no more believe these claims than they would have believed the testimony of the fruit of her womb when he testified in their own city that he was the Messiah of whom Isaiah had spoken. Can you imagine? Have you ever thought about this? We just read these stories, I think, sometimes. Think, okay, angel come to Mary, prepare da, da. No, do you think about the ridicule she must have went through and the gossip that was going on behind her back and the things that were said and she tries to tell, no, look, an angel came and I am a of, of child of God. And people are like, yeah, right, Mary. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah, good story. Do you imagine how hard that must have been for a 15-year-old young woman to put up with the ridicule she must have went through and knowing the gossip that was spreading in this small little town? Can we speak too highly of her whom the Lord has blessed above all women? There was only one Christ, and there is only one Mary. Each was noble and great in pre-existence, and each was foreordained to, ministry, to the ministry he or she performed. We cannot but think that the Father would choose the greatest female spirit to be the mother of his Son, even as he chose the male spirit likened to him to be the Savior. I think when we see who Mary was in the purest life, we will all even reverence her more. Well, Luke 1, 34, Mary says, But how should this be, seeing I know not a man? Well, let's see what she's saying about that, because she doesn't know a man. She knows Joseph, and she knows she can be married to, can, you know, be fully married to him, not just espoused. And so what, what is she really asking? Here's what Elder Bruce R. McConkie says. Mary asked, how shall this be seen? I know not a man. Obviously, she could at the proper time know Joseph, and he could be the father of all her children, not just those who came after the firstborn. She knew that. But already the concept was framed in her mind that the promised son was not to originate from any power on earth. This offspring was to be himself almighty God's almighty son. How and by what means and through whose instrumentality such a conception come? That's what she's asking. 
How has this happened? I know not a person of this spiritual caliber that I could be the mother of the Son of God. I don't know that kind of man. So she's already thinking in eternal and celestial terms. Well, Luke 1, 35, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. Gabriel answered, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Brothers and sisters, for you and I to be in the presence of God, the Holy Ghost must overcome us and get us in what, what we call a state of being translated, in a sense, so that we can withstand the presence of such a holy being. That's what the Holy Ghost's function is. The child's not, the Holy Ghost is not the part of the child. No, the Holy Ghost is there to overcome her so that she can be in the presence of Heavenly Father. And he is literally the Father. Here's how Nephi explained it in 1 Nephi chapter 11. Great explanation. Starting with verse 18. It's 1 Nephi 11. And he, the angel, said unto me, Nephi, Behold, the virgin whom thou seest is the mother of the Son of God, after the manner of the flesh. And it came to pass that I beheld that she was carried away in the spirit. And after she had been carried away in the spirit for the space of a time, the angel spake unto me, saying, Look. And I looked and beheld the virgin again, bearing a child in her arms. Now, Elder McConkie tells us, to be carried away in the spirit means to be transported bodily from one location to another as witness the fact that Nephi, at the very time he beheld these visions, had been carried away in the spirit of the Lord and taken bodily into an exceedingly high mountain, which he never had before seen and upon which he had never set his foot. So we know what it means to be carried away by the Spirit. Nephi tells us that it happened to him. Mary, the Holy Ghost, is overcoming her and carrying her away and transporting her into the presence of God, who has a physical body, who can now have children through Mary, a mortal. Now, the details of that conception, all of that, notice Nephi never puts. He just says, see, she's carried away in the Spirit, Holy Ghost overcoming. She can be in the presence of God. And the next thing you see is she has a child. What happens in between, brothers and sisters, is doggone, it's just none of our doggone business. It's none of our business. But she had a child after the manner of the flesh, and God the Father is the literal Father. And she was overcome by the Holy Ghost to be in God's presence. Thus we see what it means, the condescension of God. The condescension of God lies in the fact that he, God, an exalted being, steps down from his eternal throne to become the father of a mortal son, a son born after the manner of the flesh. God the Almighty, who is infinite and eternal, elects in his fathomless wisdom to beget a son, an only son, the only begotten in the flesh. So he descends to have a child with a mortal, him being an immortal being. Thus Christ, having the dual nature of mortality and immortality within his DNA and blood. Luke 1, 39-40 tells us, Mary then goes to the house of Elizabeth in Hebron, which is some 100 miles south of Nazareth. So she again goes down. Remember, she, she, I mean, she's going to do this again when Christ is born, we're going to see, but she now goes down to Elizabeth, 100 miles south. Probably doesn't go alone because of the bandits and things along the way. Some relative probably takes her. She most likely goes after telling Joseph their predicament of being with child, giving time for the Lord to work upon Joseph if he was going to divorce Mary privately. See, we're going to see that is, uh, Joseph is a just man and a righteous man, but even he is struggling with the announcement. 
and the news. And so it's probably during this time that she now leaves and Joseph now has to struggle. But once again, through miraculous means, through revelation, Mary receives a witness that the child is of God. Well, let's take a look at the Annunciation to Elizabeth, Mary's cousin. Luke 1, verses 39 through 41. Like Zacharias and Mary, Elizabeth too received her witness of the coming of the Messiah by the gift of the Holy Ghost. Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost, that same spirit that enabled Peter to testify of the Christ, Joseph Smith to see the Father and the Son, and Nephi to see a vision of Christ's ministry and future events. Notice every one of these receive a witness by revelation. Do you see a pattern here? Do you see what has to happen if we're going to receive a witness? It has to come by revelation. That's the only way you can come to know God. Since mankind cannot come to know him on his own, it's impossible. It has to come by revelation, and each one are getting their revelation. The Holy Ghost came upon Elizabeth and her unborn child. Remember, it leaped within the womb. No wonder, Christ said, John was more than just a prophet. While he is in the womb, that, un that unborn baby receives a witness of the Holy Ghost. She too now became a living witness. Well, let's turn now to Matthew chapter 2, verses 18 through 25. This is the Annunciation to Joseph, Mary's husband. Matthew 2, 18, Mary was espoused to Joseph. Well, what does that mean? meaning she had made a formal contract of marriage with him that yet had to be completed in a second ceremony before they would commence living together as husband and wife and having that sexual intimacy. She was, however, considered by their law to be his wife. The contract could be broken only by a formal bill of divorcement and and. And any inf infidelity on part would be classed as adultery, for which Jehovah had of old decreed death as the penalty. Brothers and sisters, you have to understand one of the options when Joseph learns from Mary, and she he comes home and she tells him, I'm with child. And of course, you imagine what's running through his mind. The next question, well, no, it's not mine. And then she tries to explain I, I think we just read this sometimes in a vacuum and think, oh, they just all this just all happened miraculously. No, they were human. They struggled. He's that would be so hard. And he he needs time to gain his witness. He could have had her stoned to death. That was according to the law that Jehovah himself had given. That was one of the options. Legally and righteously. And so Matthew 2.19 says, put her away privately. That Joseph wanted to believe Mary about her child being of God, but did not is seen in his desire to put away Mary privately as with as little embarrassment as possible. It shows you how tender-hearted and righteous and, and gentle and, and a just man that he was. He didn't want to belittle her. He didn't want to publicly embarrass her. He could have and had her stoned. But this shows, oh, I want to believe in Mary, but in his heart he does not. Who would come on? Your wife come out. You come home. Your wife tells you she's with child, and then it's of God, Heavenly Father's Father. You re really, you're just going to automatically accept that. Can you imagine the struggle this must have been for him? And again, the, the rumors that are spreading, especially after Mary starts showing, that are going to spread. And what that can cause in people's lives. 
He wanted to believe that, but that he didn't is shown that he was going to divorce her privately. Well, like Mary, Elizabeth, Zacharias, and all men, Joseph will also have to gain his witness by revelation and after he is tested to see if he will submit to the divine will. It is probably during the three months Mary is away visiting Elizabeth, Joseph struggles with this and receives his answer. So we've got to be careful with the description. Just think that everything happens, just boom, 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 right, run after another. There are three months go by, and I'm sure that he is praying and he is asking, and he probably does not get any answers for a while. Just like you and me, God tests us. He will try our hearts to see if even if we don't receive answers, we'll still follow him. Will you still follow me with the light knowledge you have, even if I don't answer you immediately, right away? And so it finally comes to the determination, probably after months of struggle, to put her away privately. And then we know he has the dream. Matthew 2, 20 through 23, an angel came in a dream. We read in 1 Nephi 8, 2 this, And it came to pass that while my father tarried in the wilderness, he spake unto us, saying, Behold, I have dreamed a dream. In other words, I have seen a vision. So when it says that in a dream Gabriel comes to Joseph, maybe it's in the same context as what Nephi says about his father Lehi, when Lehi says, or in other words, I have seen a vision. So when it says Joseph dreamed, Maybe, in other words, he also, too, has a vision, and Gabriel comes to him. Matthew 2, 24, then it was only after Joseph received revelation. So you have him in those verses, verse 20, he's going to put away privately. By 23, he says, yep, I'll go marry her. What's the only thing different that happens in between? Joseph received revelation that he was, it was only after Joseph received revelation that he was able to submit to the will of God in all things. Notice that's the pattern in all of these. Zacharias submits. No, his name's supposed to be John, not named after the father. Okay? Elizabeth receives a witness. She submits to the will of God. Mary receives a witness and revelation. She submits and says, be it to the handmaiden of the Lord. Do you see a pattern, brothers and sisters? If we are going to be able to submit to the will of God in our lives, what do we have to have? We have to have revelation. That's why you and I have to be about studying scripture, saying our prayers, fasting, and those kinds of things, partaking the sacrament worthily, so that we can receive revelation. You cannot do God's will without revelation. This is one of the great things all of these stories have in common. This is the pattern Christ is trying to teach us by giving us these stories. You will not be able to follow me and do all that I ask of you unless you get revelation. It will be the same for us. You and I too will need revelation if we are going to survive spiritually in any day regardless of the last days or when it is. Well, Matthew 1, 1 through 16, and Luke 3, 23 through 38, let's just make a comment. They both give the genealogy of Joseph. And let's just take a look at what that's about. Elder Bruce R. McConkie wrote, Matthew's and Luke's accounts seemingly do not agree, though in fact the two of them taken together give a perfect picture of what is involved. Both purport to give the genealogy of Joseph, whose bloodline is not involved, but who, was, uh, but who was of the royal lineage. It is generally agreed that Matthew's account gives the royal lineage and therefore records names of those whose right it was to sit on the, David's throne. So Matthew's giving that Joseph is descendant of the high priest who was to be able to sit on the throne in Judah. I'm sorry, not the high priest, but of Judah to sit on the throne, the royal line. And that Luke's record contains the personal pedigree of Mary's husband. 
Matthew says Joseph was a son of Jacob, and Luke says he was a son of Heli. It appears, however, that Jacob and Heli were brothers, and that Heli was the father of Joseph, and Jacob the father of Mary, making Joseph and Mary first cousins with the same ancestral lines. How fitting it is that in the New Testament should preserve both a royal and a personal pedigree of these two, so that there could be no question, either by blood or by kingly right, as to the noble and exalted status of the son of David. And then Elder McConkie quotes Brother Ta Elder Talmage, Had Judah been a free and independent nation, ruled by her rightful sovereign, Joseph the carpenter's son, I'm sorry, Joseph the carpenter would have been her crowned king, and his lawful successor to the throne would have been Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. How different do you think the story would be in the New Testament if Christ was born in a palace? See, that's who should have been in the palace, not Herod. It was Joseph. He is the legal, rightful, royal descendant to be the king of the Jews. And then Jesus would have been his legal successor. How different do you think it would have been? and how Christ is born in the lowliest of positions. Well, let's take a look at how every one of these individuals were tried and tested before they received their witness, their revelation. Do you see another pattern? Before revelation comes, brothers and sisters, we are tried and tested. God does not give us revelation just out of curiosity. He gives it to us if he knows that we are going to obey it and live up to it. Because if we don't, then it condemns us more, and he doesn't want to do that. So we will be tried and tested. We learn obedience by the things which we suffer, or through the experiences we go through, which unfortunately sometimes involves suffering. Let's take a look at each one of these. Elizabeth. A daughter of Aaron, highly endowed spiritually, rich in faith, she too was being tested and tried and purified. With child in her advanced years facing problems foreign to young women who bear children, emotionally troubled, fearing to face her friends of years, she had hid herself five months to return to normal association just before Mary's visit. He imagined the trial and testing she went through and having a child that must come, the trial and testing, the, 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 the suffering that must come from having a child in such advanced years. Again, you can't just read these things haphazardly and, oh, that child, move on. No, how hard that must have been for her. That she was overwhelmed at the honor that was hers to bear the soul of him who would prepare the way for the king of Israel, we can well imagine that the fruit of her womb was so important in the Lord's plan and that Gabriel himself came to announce the conception was almost beyond human comprehension. Faithful Elizabeth was being tested and rewarded. Carrying a child for nine months in that advanced state one can only imagine the challenges. It's challenging of a woman of normal childbearing years to what now she is asked to go through. Zacharias could no longer speak or hear. For more than nine months, he was shut out completely from the normal communion and the unusual intercourse with his Judean friends. We suppose he went about his priestly duties as best he could, even journeying back to the temple after a six-month interval for his assigned week of ceremonial service. No doubt he wrote for Elizabeth to read the account of the angel who stood between the golden altar of incense and the seven-branched candlestick and proclaimed that she would bring forth the one to prepare the way for the great Messiah. And now Elizabeth, with child in her advancing years, needed special care and attention. You imagine seeing now Zacharias has got to help provide that. And he is in his advancing years. The trials of life and the testing and anxieties of mortality surely were increasing in the life of this pious priest, who yet continued as theretofore to walk blamelessly before the Lord. So Zacharias, for nine months, 
not being able to communicate, but yet having a wife to take care of in advanced years. Can you imagine what that must have been like? And now we turn to Joseph, a just man, one who loved the Lord and waited for the consolation of Israel. What a refiner's fire he must have gone through during the weeks and months before Gabriel spoke peace to his soul. Mary, his beloved, the one to whom he had given a right of espousement, the fairest and most spiritually endowed of all the virgins of the land, his espouse wife, she was with child by another. Joy and gladness, thanksgiving and the sound of melody, once these had filled his soul. Now there was despondency and despair. What should he do? Surely he could not make her a public example. She must not bear the onus of adultery. Yet instead he would put her away privately. He would ease her burden as best he could. Can you imagine the months and the pain that he went through and trying to decide what to do? and how to handle this news, and yet still remains faithful, and he finally receives his answer. And then, last but not least, and what of Mary, what of her? Should her testing be any easier, her mortal trials lessened because she carried in the womb the son of the highest? Should she be free from the burdens borne by Sarah and Miriam, whose very name in Hebrew she bore, and by the other great women of their Abrahamic lineage? Nay, rather, should not her burdens be greater? Whenever was there a great prophet, Moses, Elijah, Isaiah, Nephi, Joseph Smith, who was not tested to the full? Whenever were the women who stood by their sides freed from the tests and trials of mortality? The greater the prophet, the more severe the test. And this isn't a prophet. This is a son of God. Can you imagine at age 15? And it, it's supposed that the reason she's going down to Elizabeth is maybe her mother is no longer alive and she needs help. And that's who she turns to, her cousin, Elizabeth. Can you imagine what's going through her mind at such a young age? And all, like I said, the rumors are going to start floating and all that she's going to have to contend with. And how she's wondering how Joseph is going to handle news. And the way he does handle it. And then what is he going to decide? And then she takes on it. Oh my goodness, brothers and sisters. The trials and tests these people went through. We should all bow in humble reverence and thank God. It was the Son of God who descended below all things that he might raise to heights unknown. It was his mother who is subject to the most trying of all circumstances, that she too might ascend the throne of eternal power, as had Rebecca and Rachel and her ancestors of old. Do you see a pattern, brothers and sisters? Before great spiritual blessings come, there will always be sacrifices to be made. Trials and testing and sacrifices, they go hand in hand. May we be as faithful as Elizabeth, Zacharias, Joseph, and Mary. May we be willing to make the sacrifices necessary so that we can receive our witnesses that we need so that we will also follow the will of God. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel.